Hello and welcome to the Life and Ministry Podcast, where three pastors hang out each week to have lighthearted and engaging conversations about life and ministry. For more information, visit us on our website at lifeandministry.net. This is episode 35 and welcome guys once again to another episode. Great to hang out with you all again. Yeah, good to see you guys actually live and in person. Yeah, Michael's Still- rocking his 1990s beat bopping headphones there. I'm loving that, dude. Yeah, you know, I want to make sure that uh, that our people know how uh, how tech savvy I am, that I have the official <laughs> headphones on. So uh, they're not Beats headphones, but uh, they're ones from my worship pastor. So I'm pretty sure they're uh, probably expensive if I had to guess. So, <laughs> Well, what's, what's really amazing now is we have the progression of headphones. So we've got Michael's old school ones, and then we got Scott's earbuds. Yeah. And- yeah, you see, there you go. The typical yeah. iPod, Air, iPhone, yeah. AirPods. And then, of course, you got my AirPods, bro. So, of course, I always got to be the most tech advanced here in the group. But You're just an idolater is what that is. Ooh. Mm. Mm. Did that is, that, that, is that how we're going to start the show? Is that how we're going to do this right now? You have uh, you I'm have partaken kicking. of the evil fruit known as Apple. Yeah, I'm oh. just kicking you while you're down. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry that you're Yankees lost it's oh. as magic as watching the death star explode <laughs> we are starting this episode all star over Wars. we're starting <laughs> we're doing this all over again i cannot handle this i cannot continue oh yeah it's been it's been a rough week it's been a rough week sports wise for me my my giants lost on the last second field goal 63 yarder the panthers kicker kick to beat the giants wow as the final seconds ticked away 63 yards yep um nuts and uh, of course, it was heartbreaking because they had just taken the lead again uh, after coming back. Uh, I think they were down a couple touchdowns earlier on, but anyway. So yeah, that was uh, that was heartbreaking. But and then the Yankees just put up a zero, man. I mean, they just whiffed big time at home. At home, it was just as bad as you can get. But that's okay. Yeah. I'm here. I'm here with you guys, thinking I was going to be encouraged, but maybe not. I was expecting you to have on your funeral black and all that kind of stuff, Dan, but uh, you're still trying to represent the Yankees with the blue, though, aren't you? That's right, man. Channeling, That's right. channeling your inner Yankee. So. Yeah, well, the camera can't see it, but up, up here I'm looking at a signed picture of Mickey Mantle and Phil Rizzuto and, uh, and a picture of the old Yankee Stadium. So it just makes the office complete. Yeah, so uh, note to self, if you need a piece of memorabilia to hawk, you can go to Dan's office and <laughs> grab that off the wall and uh, turn it loose. So Yeah, yeah. Hey, you were wanting some, some you know, capital for your building project, Dan. Just that, that might get you a little bit. That's right. So everyone who would like to steal it, go to North River Church. And I have an office that's in a like a single family <laughs> home right by a <laughs> vacant land there. Yes, in yes. In Parish, Florida. That's it. That's it. So, uh, so here's the question, guys. Um, I, I'm feeling uh, a little uh, with the weather. I guess is that the right way to say it? So uh, with it, okay. With the weather, instead of under the weather, because they did name the hurricane this time <laughs> after me. Yeah. And uh, so I actually had a buddy of mine in uh, Georgia that uh, caught you know pretty good uh, weather coming through there. Uh, he sent me a message and said. Uh, I said, wow, uh, I'm sure everybody's already told you how much they appreciate your grand arrival yesterday. You've got a lot of cleaning up to do. Mm. <laughs> and, um, so, I, you know, I'm I'm feeling with the weather at the moment, and that's not necessarily a good thing. So I know we got a lot of folks no. that uh, are uh, seeing incredible destruction. And so I'm, I'm very much hoping that they retire, Michael, and uh, we won't have to deal with that again. So, yeah. No, uh, two things, a serious one and a funny. Uh, serious is that uh, Send Relief is one of the best agencies to get disaster relief. So if you're wanting to help with the Hurricane Michael uh, relief effort, you can give through that. The yep. funny is I was at a buddy's wedding and we were watching their honeymoon location be decimated by a hurricane Ooh. that was named after one of his ex-girlfriends. <laughs> mm. <laughs> And wow. so we were in the hotel room, you know, patting them on the back saying, dude, I'm so sorry. You guys will find something else. What's the name of the storm? And we just all fell on the 
floor laughing. We're like, this is perfect justice that your the hurricane trashing your honeymoon is named for your ex girlfriend. Wow, it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I I get why they kind of name this. I guess I don't get what they name the storms after people. Yeah, but uh, I mean, if like if you're a Katrina or a, now a Michael, I mean, whenever people hear your name, especially in the area that it was affected, it's you know your name's tarnished, man. Yeah, there's a whole, for real. Yeah, there's a whole thing on Twitter right now of people that have names that are names of people in the news that are like, "This has been the crappiest week of my life." Yeah, uh, one guy is a Brett Kavanaugh. And I saw, saw that. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's like, dude, it, it can't be any worse for me right now. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's uh, Jared Wilson, Jared C. Wilson on Twitter. Um, he there's another guy named Jared Wilson that like I guess a lot of people like to quote him, but tag this Jared and vice versa. So they always go back and forth saying, "I am the real Jared Wilson." That's it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Would the real Slim Shady please stand up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Speaking of Slim Shady, uh, there was Ooh. some Slim Shady happening in the White House today. Did you guys catch uh, catch that before we went on the air? No. What happened? Uh, I was thoroughly entertained because for about 20 minutes before we went on air, I was watching Kanye West wax eloquent. Uh, well, I don't know if eloquent is the way to say it. He was dropping some F-bombs in the Oval Office. Seriously. <laughs> live, live on camera with the whole press corps surrounding them wearing a red make America great uh, red hat again. And yeah, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. It was, it's definitely going to be the talk of the rest of the day on every news cycle and Saturday night live might do just an entire episode on it. It was that like cringeworthy and oh. newsworthy. Um, and some of the things he was saying, I'm just like, Wow, is he really saying this right now? Yes. Um, yeah, he is. Like, yeah, like yeah. he's in the Thank Oval you. Office and he's dropping f bombs like right there. Jeez. Yeah, thanks, Yeezy. Uh, wow. And uh, uh, yeah. his his name is no longer Kanye; it's just Ye. Isn't yeah, that right? yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. That's his. Uh, this I guess this is like when Puff Daddy went from Puff to Puff Daddy to Puffy to P Diddy. And I couldn't keep track of it all. Uh, that was yeah. The, the midst of my rap heyday back in back in the day. No, tell the truth. You used to have a rap heyday. I, I yeah, I went to I went to school in, in the hood, and so, uh, my I love it. So when we're talking about writing here in a little bit, my okay. productivity soundtrack is about seventy five percent nineties uh, hip hop. Okay. And grunge, nineties grunge music and hip hop. Mm, so, there you yeah. go. Yeah, so I so have, now by '90s grunge, I mean we're talking like uh, Nirvana, some of yeah, that. Yeah, Nirvana, okay. uh, Wallflowers, Live. Uh, okay. You know, the, back when music was, you know, when it was like cutting edge to do that, and and now it's just, panic. No, I didn't get no. I, I feel okay. like I was kind of yeah. Uh, I came out of being very sheltered to uh, school in the hood, so it was pretty pretty drastic the the changeover. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, so there was a there was a phase of, of having uh, I didn't have the I didn't have any rap albums. I couldn't quite sneak that past my parents, but um, definitely had mixtapes that had um, a lot of uh, Biggie and uh, Dr. Dre and Snoop on it. So okay, yeah, yeah. Tupac. See, I'll never forget. I had uh, so I grew up in uh, South Georgia and was kind of in the redneck phase of uh, of my life at that point. So I drove a F-150 that was jacked up, had uh, big tires on it, had a uh, um, grill guard on the front, tool backs on the, toolbox on the back, the big uh, whip um, antenna for the CB radio inside my truck that I That's, had to have. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so I had that, but uh, then I got uh, two 10-inch uh, subwoofers put in under the back seat, and so me and uh, Eminem would uh, would rock out together, and uh, so I would blare Eminem riding in my redneck truck. When so, you said you went through a redneck phase, I was expecting Kid Rock. Oh no 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 <laughs> no no! So I listen to country music, and still do listen to country music. So that's my uh, sermon prep music is uh, listening to country, and uh, either that or uh, some Bob Dylan something like that. So, uh, so gotcha. that's, 
that's kind of where I go on uh, on that. So, so Dan, um, you're holier than both of us. Um, what's your I'm, What's your soundtrack for productivity and writing? I'm sure Dan's is probably like classical. Um, let's see what else. What else would be something that Dan would uh, would subscribe to? Something something like. Um, just uh, just piano music. Or, wow, you guys really uh, don't thinking, know me at all, do you? <laughs> I'm Mozart, I'm, that kind of stuff. I'm willing to bet he's got Jay Z and Alicia Keys' "Empire State of Mind" somewhere on there, just because it's for New York. I'm I'm willing to bet he's got that. I will say that when we did drive into the city this past summer, we might have actually blasted that song in our. It is a great car. song. I love it. Uh, they always played it for the Big East tournament when Louisville was in the Big East. I fell in love with the song because they'd always play in the garden. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. As a teenager, as a teenager, I did go through a gangster rap phase. <laughs> <laughs> a gangster rap phase where, yeah, I had some, I had some people that we won't mention right now, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So no, I don't, don't listen to that anymore to get pumped up for a sermon, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm just going to go spiritual on you, man. I just listened to, uh, T uh, T4G live. Oh, oh yeah, you are more spiritual than us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, listen. You want to get some uh, some lyrics for your messages? Listen to a little Dylan. A little Bob Dylan. Will, like a Rolling uh, Stone. I mean, he strings together some some lyrics that make you make you smile as a pastor. Yeah. So, do you do you buy into that he got saved during the Jesus movement, or are you kind of like was that just a bad trip that day? Yeah, I think he was smoking something. Yeah, he always has been smoking something. I'm pretty sure, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, I think that was just maybe a convenient uh, convenient phase for him to kind of roll that out, and um, it's always interesting to listen to him and uh, do some interviews because. He's not the easiest interviewee, and I always like to see the, uh, the the folks trying to interview him squirming around to try to figure because out. It doesn't make much sense in what yeah, he's what he's he, talking about. He really but. doesn't. He doesn't make a whole lot of sense at all. And um, and they're trying to put. I mean, it's like they're thinking he's about to to come out with some just remarkable saying, you know, tweetable phrase or something, mm -hmm. and then he just it's flat, and they're like. Yeah, but tell me what you think about this. And he was like, "Yeah, I don't know." <laughs> and they're like, "No, no, no, listen, no, listen, no, listen, no. He's like, I, "I, nothing." He's the Bill, <laughs> the Bill Belichick of musicians. That's yes, yeah. As far as interview goes, yep, absolutely. No, yeah, I got no. I I like Billy Joel. Um, I like uh, the Beatles. Um, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. Yeah. Any yeah. of you guys uh, like some hard rock guys, you know, going back to, um, you know, Led Zeppelin, ZZ Top, any of you guys? The, the key to my wife's heart is 80s hair metal. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she grew up a PK, so her dad would, would, would have the sermon tapes. She would color over them with black Sharpie, and then that's what she would make her mixtapes of. Ooh. Guns N' Roses, ACDC, Metallica. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so we have um, on number on a number of occasions jammed out to uh, Welcome to the Jungle um, in, in our car. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. She is. So, so we've had conversations in-house here about uh, preacher walkout music. So uh, as you're coming up to deliver uh, your walk, message, walk up music, yeah, walk up, yeah, music. walk up music. So uh, like they do in uh, in baseball, yeah. Um, so we we've we've had that conversation at times, uh, maybe maybe themed around the sermon or something like that. So uh, so you never know. We may uh, we may roll out with something something like that. So. That would be. What would your walk up? What what would your walk up song be? Well, I think it, I think it's all dependent on the message series at that point. So you try to th try to theme it to uh, maybe the sermon title or something like that, you know? So yeah. there's, there's a lot of options out there. So just since we're talking about music, cause this is always an interesting topic for me to, to hear people talk about uh, what decade do you think has the greatest music? Hmm. I'm partial to the nineties because 
and I feel like we're all partial to whenever it was that we. You're were. not a new kid on the block kind no, of guy. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hanson, a little M. Yeah, no, boy bands. She was. She had a uh, Justin Timberlake posters all over her room. Yeah. Um, no, I mean it's whatever age you were when you were like when you got your first car or uh, you know hanging out in the summertime or something like that. It's whenever that was. So like for me it's like 1995 to 1997 is like the, the apex of all kinds of music because that was af after that it was like okay now we're, now we're old you know now we're getting old um so 80, 90s for nostalgia 80s for uh just pure one hit wonder glory all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna push the envelope here i'm gonna say the the 70s had the best music boom Bingo, yeah. Michael. i agree I'm thinking, yeah, that's a good, i'm that's thinking good. I'm oh. thinking the seventies. I'm thinking uh country music, everything from uh the mid nineties back from the mid nineties, late nineties through about two thousand and well, it's just now country music is terrible. Uh mm -hmm. minus a few good, you know, a few good folks that uh that, that have stepped in that you you know, you look and you're like, Man, that's just that guy can can sing or whatever. So, uh, you know, when Chris Stapleton comes out, I mean, that that's the real deal. Uh, when Luke Bryan comes out, which is from my hometown, uh, you just look and go, dude, you can't sing. Hmm. So yeah. anyway, yeah, definitely seventies for me too. And yeah. a little bleed into the sixties. I thought some sixties had some great songs as well, but seventies, I think tops it. Yeah. The eighties, something drastically happened. All that, like the it's keyboard. called cocaine that's what happened <laughs> <laughs> a little psychedelic stuff yeah. going on over there too much so. too much keyboard pop in the 80s for me to really get into that but yeah but. see and it took country music until around the late 90s for that to to roll out there you know and that's mm -hmm. that's when it started uh, what i call bro country mm -hmm. uh, yeah you know it's just mm -hmm. it's just bad yeah so hey guys let's go to our main topic of the day um we're going to be talking about pastoral writing. And um, so I know all three of us have done some writing. Uh, both of you are published authors and um, have uh, have written some books and both of you have blogs. And so I, let's just talk about that just because I think that is an important topic because writing can be a, a, a big way that a pastor can influence his congregation. Um, and, you know, not necessarily writing books to be on the rich and famous top 10 publishers list, but what, what, what are some ways, uh, some helpful ways that pastors can get involved in helping their congregation by writing? Yeah, I guess the first thing I'd say is, um, you know, don't, don't go into writing, like you said, to try to, to try to get rich. There's really not any money to be made in publishing, uh, you know, putting out content. Um, it's definitely not worth what you put into it. Uh, but I think it's a, I think it's a helpful extension of the preaching ministry um, because it's it's transferable, it's take homeable, um, and and so I think there's a lot where we can we can write and really have kind of a lasting impact beyond the pulpit. Um, so that'd be just kind of my first thought on it, Michael. What about you? Yeah, no, I think that's definitely true. I think that. Certainly, for uh, in in the Christian world, um, the and, and and probably in the secular world as well. If unless you have a tremendous platform, you're not going to make any money writing. So I think the uh, the grand illusions of becoming the next John Grisham or uh, the next uh, whoever uh, that that is a full time writer is probably not not realistic. And so I would encourage somebody, Hey, go into it with that mindset. Um, and have, uh, have something to say rather than mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to get it out. And uh, I think, I think all, all good writers, uh, people that have a passion for writing would write whether or not they're going to be published or not. And, yeah. and, and, you know, so for me, I look at it from that perspective of the reason that I write is because I can't not write. Um, I know that's not good grammar, but, uh, 
that's the that's just the real you know realization that I've come to you and uh, and I and I'll be honest to you I think I am uh, a better writer than I am a speaker most of the mm. time um, so mm-hmm. I, I think uh, I think writing allows for a sense of precision that maybe uh, speaking and and preaching messages doesn't allow for. Um, allows you to, to really work through a topic and, and kind of examine it from all sides. Uh, whereas you're somewhat limited in your time and in your speaking, uh, in your preaching ministry. And so I, yeah, definitely, uh, I would, I would certainly say, uh, don't write because you feel like you have to write because you can't not write. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, what are, what are your thoughts on, uh, on writing? Yeah, exactly. Um, I echo everything you guys have just said. And, you know, um, we're, we're just looking for other ways. You know, I, uh, John MacArthur at the uh, T4G this past year said, uh, one of the greatest works in pastoral ministry is the sanctification of your people. And mm-hmm. so in thinking of that, as we're preaching from the pulpit, as we're leading Bible studies in small groups and discipling people, you know, I think... Uh, maybe a way that could be missed because we're just too busy. Maybe we think is just the gift of writing. I think writing is a gift. you know, the Bible was given to us in words. I mean, uh, in sentences, I mean, it's just a tremendous detail. Not that our words are inspired at all, but it's just the medium that I think God has used for, for so many centuries, um, uh, longer than that, actually to, to communicate his message. And I think that we, uh, are missing out on, on a great opportunity if we, uh, don't utilize it. Now, you might say, maybe the people listening to this say, well, I, I'm a terrible writer. I failed English grammar. Hmm. Well, the only way to improve your writing is, guess what? To, to write. write. To yeah. write, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like anything. I mean, you're not going to get um, more experience or you're not going to improve at something that you're not well, doing well unless you actually do it. And I really don't consider myself a writer. Now, I'm not a published author by any means, but five years ago, I decided, or six years ago, I decided to, when I became the pastor here at Northwest, to, uh, to write a, a study book. I got the idea from, you know, Rick Warren's 40 Days of Purpose. He had his people reading the Purpose Driven Life book. And so I said, you know, why can't we do something like that? So I just wrote a, little, a small devotional, covered 40 different days on a topic, and I just went at it. And the first year started very small. It was very simple. It was maybe three to 500 words per day. And then from there, I, you know, that went over so well that uh, I said, you know what? And only my people really had access to it. Um, so the next year we decided to do it again and we did it for five years in a row. Um, so I just, I took a little break from it this year just because I have some other things going on. Um, but yeah, just writing necessarily books, but, um, but uh, articles, blogs, uh, things in the for the bulletin. I mean, there are so many ways you can get your message out and shape your people outside the pulpit. And I think mm-hmm. one great way of seeing this is seeing your writing ministry as an extension of your pulpit yeah. ministry. Yeah. Maybe it's something that you're going to hammer hammer down um, in, in ways that you couldn't from the pulpit um, because of you know time ways. But maybe you could do a series of you know, 10 articles as you're preaching whatever series you're doing to maybe take one truth and expound it in, 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 in better ways. Yeah. And there's a lot now where, where the market isn't controlled by big players. It's a very entrepreneurial market for writing. And so you don't need a contract with a publisher to put anything out. You can self-publish stuff like Dan does with, with his church. You can, you can get a blog for free. You can connect uh, your church's communication platforms to some kind of a writing platform and, and piggyback on that one. Um, it, I feel like one thing that you have to know when you go into being a writer as a pastor is knowing a, a few things. Um, you know what your, your what your capacity is. Um, not every pastor needs to write a book. Um, I, I remember reading, remember hearing from a publisher one time that everyone has a book in them. And for most people, that's where it needs to stay. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so because it's a, it, when you write a book, you're, you're <clears throat> writing something that you're putting your heart and soul into, and you have to love it so much that you're willing to see it through the end and not, and you're going, eventually you're, an editor is going to tell you your baby's ugly. And that's when you have to go, do I love what I have to say more than I love getting this book published? 
And if you, yeah. if you want to be published more than you love what you have to say, then your book's not worth reading. Um, mm. The other thing is um, know your audience and that's where you go, okay, who do I want to communicate to? You know, do I want to communicate to other pastors? Do I want to do um, academic work? You know, do I want to publish journal articles? Do I want to publish research? Mm. Uh, am I capable of publishing research? I've, I've read countless articles by pastors who have no business doing um, research because they don't know the first principles of doing um, statistics. And so they don't need to mess with that. They need to, they need to stay where, where they are comfortable. And that's okay. It's not a knock. On the other side, some some statisticians don't need to be writing to the church because they don't. That's not their wheelhouse. And then the third thing I'd say is to know what your know what your op options are. Um, you know, and that's where you go. Okay, you know, am I, am I, do I, how do I want to communicate this? Do I want to? Um, and and the easiest place to always start is a blog because you own the content, you control the content, and you 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 write what you want how you you want when you want um you know for me i've i used to write on anything that came to mind and it ended up being a shotgun blast and so for me i've, I've tailored everything to um my two big passions which are leadership and families um so leadership and developing strong families and and that's all i write about i don't i don't mess with culture i don't mess with politics i don't mess with history um those are the so get a things. focus is what you're saying get, yeah, a, focus. get a focus yeah because that's a lot Fun. easier to say yeah yeah what yeah. am i going to write about today it's just well get in your wheelhouse yeah get write what you're passionate about yeah. and that's that's going to come easy yeah you, know, you have to find you have to find that niche and yeah. and not only that you're passionate about that, but also if, if you want people to read it, something that people are interested in as well. So it's not just the find your niche. It's, it's find something that people are actually going to, going to read. And so for Scott, you look at that and you go, man, people are interested in leadership and families are interested in growing stronger and, mm -hmm. and being better. And so, I mean, I think those are high demand areas for uh, that people want to read um, so yeah, I, I definitely think that's the case. Like for me, I think about writing on uh, probably four levels, at least in my mind. Uh, the first level is just journaling. And, uh, and so I have a daily journal that I, that I write in and, uh, you know, uh, until I'm dead, probably nobody's going to ever read that. Um, but it gives me an opportunity to express, you know, where I am at the moment, what I'm thinking through, uh, maybe some struggles, um, some wins. I mean, just, you know, things like that. And it's not, um, it's not anything that I anticipate being published any day. It's just, Hey, here's what's going on in my head and in my heart. Here's what I'm thinking through. And so, um, so I, I journal, um, I have a blog that, that I write things in and, and I'll be honest, Scott's got a lot more, uh, discipline in that area than I do. I struggle to, uh, to keep up with that. Um, to the point that, you know, a few months ago I, I told, uh, I told you guys that I had, uh, lost the password and got locked out of my blog. <laughs> and I was actually kind of okay with that for, you know, I was like, well, all right, it's, uh, it's there and just kind of go from there. <laughs> um, so I think you got, I think you, you know, you can, you can certainly write in a blog or website or something like that. Then, you know, we've talked about articles and uh, this would be in my mind, something that would be published outside of your blog or maybe a, a number of blog posts put together mm -hmm. into a longer article that you would, you know, send out to a, some type of journal or, uh, you know, uh, a newspaper or something like that. You know, early on in uh, my ministry, I wrote, a um, ask the pastor um, uh, section in a newspaper in our local hometown and uh, people could email me questions and I try to answer those questions in this little deal. And um, so I, th I think you got those types of things. Um, and then maybe some smaller works, you know, Dan, you had mentioned um, the, uh, the 40 days uh, books that you had put out for your congregation. Um, I've done some similar things like that, whether it's a, a devotional guide, uh, did a devotional guide for uh, families around Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just again, in a desire to serve and equip our, uh, our families at our church when I was working through that, um, you know, I did uh, the, on my uh, website, the thing that gets downloaded the most is I wrote a uh, six 
uh, small group sessions for uh, Tom Rainer's book, I'm a Church Member. And, uh, and those six sessions are downloaded uh, more than anything else that I have. Um, you know, to the tune of it's funny because I can see the traffic ramp up on Saturday nights uh, because I think folks are grabbing them at the last minute to uh, be able to to have for their uh, for their people. And mm. um, so, you know, got that. And then um, then books. And I I've, I've published one book uh, that was uh, kind of a revamp of uh, my doctoral uh, project and my uh, doctor of ministry work. And. So I yeah I think those What's are the, the areas. What's title that, Michael? Uh, Parent driven discipleship, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's it's available on Amazon if if anybody's interested. It is just again an attempt to equip uh, the families and and my local church to better disciple their teenagers. So that was that was the whole goal in uh, in that project that I did for my D man and also in what was going on for uh, for that book. So. Cool. Excellent. So what we're saying is, uh, you know, have, have your passion, know your people, uh, check your pride, right? I mean, have yeah. the right motivations for doing whatever kind of writing you're doing. And um, like Scott said in the beginning, I thought that was a great point. If you're going to write to make money, to just just don't even start. Um, you know, write. yeah, your, your best option on that, and this sounds really, really bad, but try to get in touch with someone who is well known and has a platform that has ghost writers that write their books for them. If you want to yeah. make money, I mean, yeah. that sounds, I, I hate to say it that way, but no, that's the only way to make money is unless yeah. you, I mean, 1% of people who write books do it full time. Right? Yeah. Everybody else is doing it as a side hustle. I, I'll right. say between the, the two that I've had published, I don't think I could afford to take my wife out on a date with what I've sold <laughs> off of those. I, yeah. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, would I write them both again in a heartbeat? You know, right. They, right. they were worth every mm -hmm. bit of, of angst and, and labor to put out something that I believed in. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, I think along with this, and you said, you made a comment, you know, people don't feel like they're strong writers. The best thing you can do as a writer is get a good editor. Um, and, and because a good editor is going to, to help you in ways that you're not strong in. I don't know a lot of pastors who can identify a split infinitive or who can, you know, uh, properly use a semicolon. But you might know an English major and yeah. a $10 Starbucks card is a great use of money. I've, I've done that. My sister-in-law is a, was an English major in college and I would send her a manuscript and a Starbucks card and she would send back a clean, grammatically sound uh, piece that not only was good structurally, it was good uh, content wise. So, yeah. um, you know, that's the best thing, especially if you want to write and actually beyond the blog world. Um, right. Right. You know. Yeah. I've done the same way. This is an excellent opportunity to get people involved in the project. So those five 40 day studies that we did, uh, actually one was 50 days. Um, we got people involved. So we have, uh, we have a, a retired substitute teacher who taught English in our church. And so he was my main proofreader. And of mm. course we had two other people who were gifted in grammar and English. And so all three of them poured over that and uh, suffered through my, <laughs> my writing and made me sound a lot smarter than I really was, to be honest with you, or I really am. Uh, but then we also, so we have some, you know, I utilized some people that were really great in, uh, in the actual writing part of it. And then I, uh, found a couple other people, maybe two, three, four other people that really focused on the content. And mm -hmm. I say, does this make sense? Am I missing anything? Could anything could be, can anything be more clear? Uh, am I getting my point across? And so I had people look at the proofreading, uh, but I also had people look at the actual content. Is this going to be a help to somebody? I mean, is right. somebody going to learn? And, you know, so just what, it's just not my project. Now it's this team of people in our church that are pouring themselves in their time into this, right. to make this big project and this big kickoff in the fall actually happen, mm -hmm. which is, which is a great way, not just for you to serve people, but to get, allow the gifts of people in your church in these ways to really come to the surface and, and be a blessing to the whole church, which is really what it's all about. So, um, 
so yeah, and you know, so, someone could say, "Well, I'm never going to be a published writer," and you're probably right. I mean, I mean, the That's chances okay. of, the yeah. chances of that happening are fine, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that you don't have to write or can write. Like yeah. somebody says, I think with Scott, not, not everyone should write a book and that's fine. Um, but there are ways you could be a blessing. Um, I mean, even if it's writing something for just a Sunday school class or, or like you said, or a blog mm -hmm. or an article and really the self publishing, I mean, we, we live in a, a much different world today, much different yeah. world where yeah. this things, these things are actually uh, inexpensive and, uh, and available to us. There right. are, uh, Amazon is even doing now. So you can upload your manuscript to Amazon and print on demand. Uh, I just yeah. got an email yesterday. Barnes and Noble's doing this now, yep. where they will print your manuscript and and uh, um, and on on a print on demand. Before you had to buy ten thousand copies, you know what I mean, or a thousand copies. You had to make actually a commitment, and that's what stopped a lot of people from making these. Right. Uh, I can't buy five thousand books. I, I don't even think I could sell twenty. I mean. What? Uh, but with the self-publishing thing, what's great about it is there's no risk. Uh, there's no there's no commitment. Uh, Lulu, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and there's other companies out there. Mm -hmm. um, you upload the manuscript, and if all you ever print is one book for your own library, then that's all it is. Yeah. And and it comes yep. out in a. I'm just going to show you just just a copy for those who who might consider doing this. Here's just a copy. Look at of that mine. plug, Dan. Way to go. No, yeah. no wait, this is this is not my this is not my this is not my pick of the week, okay? This is not my pick of the oh. week. Hey, but if you want to buy it, it is on Amazon, okay? So this is just grace upon grace, but this doesn't come in like in a stapled, uh, you know, what I mean, put together uh fall apart kind of book. I mean, this is this is professionally bound, perfect bound, whatever they call it. Um it's it's a high quality print and it's self-published. I mean, and outside of the name of the publisher and the author, you wouldn't be able to tell the quality of it and lo looks really well. And those books with shipping probably cost us five or six dollars a piece to make. Yeah. Uh, so the cost was pretty low. So my point is this. If you want to do it and you have the desire to do it, just try it and stop making these excuses like, well, that's not me or it's too expensive or whatever. Uh, you can be a blessing to your church in ways that I don't think you can't even begin to imagine. Yeah, and and there's so much to take to bless your church to serve them uh, that we have access to that that our predecessors didn't. You know, we had used to have to, you know, send a manuscript to a publisher where it would sit on an editor's desk for months, if not years. But now you can click and go, and that's that's accessibility and because everything's on amazon now you know not only do you have it in print but you've got it you, there's digital versions so yeah the, the even low, lower risk is a digital version right. actually i first started just with the just the kindle version and then i encountered oh, i don't know about a couple dozen people that said hey i don't have a kindle or an ipad i i like physical books i'm thinking well that's when I discovered this option. Yeah. I actually started with the digital route because that's really no risk, no commitment right. kind of deal. Um, all, all it is is a file on my computer. I'm uploading as the final product. Um, but anyway, so it's it's totally doable. Scott, what are your uh, – uh, you mentioned you had two published books. What are those? Yeah, so I, I've got two. Um, one is called Dream Teams. It's um, basically a foundation for uh, developing um, a healthy church ministry team um using uh character i'm sorry calling character competency and chemistry as the building blocks and then the other is uh start well um that's basically seven uh practices to get off to a good start in ministry whether you're just starting off or whether or you need to hit a reset it's it's geared for both um those are available on amazon um in print and kindle uh, they're through Rainer Publishing, uh, RainerPublishing.com um, is, is the host for it. So, yeah, um, they're there. Cool. <laughs> uh, one of them, I think, just got above three millionth place on Amazon. Um, yeah. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Moving up in the world, man. Yeah, I know, I know. Hey, a uh, quick question for uh, you guys thinking about writing. Uh, when do you guys typically write? Do you have a, a writing schedule that you try to follow? Is there a certain time of day that you try to write? Um, do you do you have a, a, a different process for different you know different modes of writing? What what does that look like for you guys? Well, the books um, were 
it took me about nine about nine to ten months a piece to write um and that's from studying to writing to uh, editing the whole the whole process because we were doing one of these a year so it was about a nine to ten month process um so but to be honest with you just whatever time i could find available whether it was early in the morning before everyone woke up at my house or staying up late um before after everyone went to bed or uh, if it was on an afternoon when i didn't have a couple of meetings to attend or whatever i mean just i guess i don't have a uh, that kind of uh, set schedule or, or place to do that it was just whenever i could find uh the time to pour into it yeah yeah when i've when i've done stuff it's it's usually been at night um some of that was to guard against, you know, um, and some of it, you know, it was stick. I don't want to say being a stickler for not using church time for it, but I, I wanted to wanted it to be clear this was this was a side thing, and so I would usually work on it at night. I'm also a night owl, so I do my best work from, you know, nine nine thirty till you know twelve thirty or one in the morning, um, and so I would I would write then. Um, I'd, I'd always set a word count goal for the day and I would, I would write a thousand words, 500 words, whatever it was, um, knowing that when I went back a week later to edit, I might keep 400 of them. Um, but I wanted to put everything down and then refine it later. Um, it's just it, uh, from start to finish, uh, from conception to, uh, production dream teams was about eight months. Uh, start well was, Close to two years, but but the last half of that was um, hangups in the production schedule more than anything on my end. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's it's a tedious thing. When I've done journal articles, same thing. You know, work at night. Um, I've got little kids, and I can't think when they're awake. Uh, Michael, <laughs> you can probably testify to that one. Um, when they're awake, there's too much noise. I can't think, and so yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I always try to figure it out and you know it, there's never a good time to write for me just being honest it, i don't i don't think there's ever a good time i think you have to make the time and, yeah. and find you know moments when you have an opportunity uh typically i take fridays off um and, and i may do some writing on fridays to 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 work through that I do some in the evening um but yeah i, th I think it's just a matter of if it's important enough, you'll squeeze the time in to uh, yeah. to do it either by getting up early, staying up late, and uh, make it work. So, are you guys working on any uh, any writing projects right now that uh, that are kind of on the horizon that you are excited about looking looking at down the road? Not me. I like I said, I took this year off. I'm not a hundred percent sure what's going to happen next year, whether we're going to do another forty days or not. So. I uh, got to evaluate that over the next couple of months. Cause if I am, I got to get started. Yeah. I, I'm like in early stages. I, I haven't done anything from an academic perspective in quite a while. And, um, and so I was toying with a friend of mine doing one on looking at uh, questions of gender roles in SBC churches um, I've, I've published enough stuff on staff dynamics. I, I kind of wanted to, to branch out. And I've been really looking into this, but I mean, just the, the time it takes to develop a survey instrument, we're, we're on like our third draft of the survey questions and we aren't even anywhere close to running it as a pilot yet before we send it out to, to pastors. So that's going to be a long way off. I've had a couple of book ideas that I've toyed with, but um, nothing where I've actually put pen to paper um, one on, you know, principle driven exposition, um, kind of my, uh, my homiletic method. And then another one on connecting generations within the church. Um, I've toyed with both of those, but I've just never put anything to paper. So that's a long way to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. you, yeah, yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm working right now, uh, with a friend and, uh, he's actually the, uh, the general editor of a series, um, for, uh, Dr. James Leo Garrett, who was, um, church history and uh, systematic theologian at mm -hmm. Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, and so he's actually editing, uh, complete works of, uh, Dr. Garrett right now. Um, and so there's, uh, I believe, uh, two volumes are, are out and published at this point. And then 
Uh, he's working on volume three. I think it's going to be an eight volume series. And so he, uh, he asked me to step in and help him uh, co-edit volume five. And uh, cool. so I'm in the, in the beginning stages of, of trying to get, uh, get that editing and proofreading and some of those things done for, uh, for that uh, volume five of uh, Dr. Garrett's uh, writing. So, uh, so working on that right now and, uh, and have toyed with uh, doing something similar to what Dan has something specifically for our church um, next fall uh, along the same lines as, uh, as a 40 day type deal. So I awesome. uh, kind of toying with that. Yeah. No, oh, very good. Very good. All right, guys. Uh, any, any other thing we missed or. I just would say past, especially pastors, because we tend to be wordy people. We get, we get paid to talk. We, we talk well when you're writing less is more. Yeah. And I, I cannot, you know, TLDR is, is a thing too long. Didn't read. And so, you know, make a word count. So when you're writing a blog, don't, don't mm. set forth to write a dissertation um, every week, cap it at a thousand words and don't go over. You'll be yeah. a more precise writer. You'll be a better writer. You'll be a more efficient writer. Uh, because you'll learn to budget your words, which is something that uh, that is a huge pet peeve of mine when uh, um, pastors write and it takes me too long to read what they're trying to say. Yeah, so, that's a great point and a great discipline that might even help your preaching as well. Yeah, yes. um, I mean, we could ramble and ramble. And I think the biggest the, the best way is to say it in the, in the most concise way possible because that's what that's what's going to stick with people yeah no occam's yeah. razor is a real thing especially for writers you know you you have mm -hmm. to do it don't do extra when less will suffice mm -hmm. so. yeah no i i definitely agree with that and i would say if you want to be a good writer uh read good writers mm -hmm. excellent read, point yeah read and read and read and read uh, if you're going to be a good writer, you're going to have to be a, a good reader and you're going to have to read good books mm -hmm. by good writers and you'll learn. Um, so I think, I think that's uh, definitely a good practice. So, yep. All right. All right, guys. Well, uh, if you are, well, to all our listeners, if you're interested in uh, learning more about uh, how to write, I'm sure these guys wouldn't mind uh, answering any questions via email or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. All and right. I, have, um, uh, so, no, I was just going to say for, for the, for a variety of sample of, of what you can do as a writer. Um, if you go to, uh, to my website, scottmdouglas.org or .com, excuse me. Um, there's an other works section and that's where, you know, most everything I've ever published it is. And you can see, you know, find out what works for you. I'm not the best academic writer. I find it stifling sometimes. Uh, but you know, you can see a number of different things that are out there. Just if you, nothing else, see what, what avenues there are. So yeah, there's my, there's my sh shameless plug. Well, here's, uh, here's something that's really bothering me about what you just said. What? I have no idea what M stands for in your name. Oh, Michael. Wow. Boom. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm so glad. Scotty. My parents were originally going to name me Michael Scott Douglas, and I, for for reasons oh. connected to the office, I am so happy that they that they did it the other way. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. Oh, that'd be classic. All right, guys. Well, it's that time again. It's time for our pick of the week. Pick of the week. Are, Ooh. Are ready to roll. This Guys, week. I'm I am on the edge of my seat, been waiting to to spill the beans Drum on roll. my pick of the week. So can I go Let's first? Yes. All right. I am uh reading a book right now that uh, I would recommend highly to anyone. The, the name uh well, of course the Bible. <laughs> Always reading that. Thanks, nice Dan. Juke there. Jesus yeah. juke. Uh, reading a book by a guy named Gary Moon, M-O-O-N, Becoming Dallas Willard, The Formation of a Philosopher, Teacher, and Christ Follower. So if you know who Dallas hmm. Willard is, uh, Spirit of the Disciplines, that Dallas Willard, um, 
pretty uh, pretty important guy, I would say, in um, in evangelical circles in the last, I don't know, 50 years or so. I uh, was a Christian philosopher, wrote a lot about um, uh, spiritual disciplines, things like that, and uh, just a fascinating guy overall. And saw this book, had somebody recommend it to me, and uh, thought, I'll read that. I like to read biographies, so it's been uh, been absolutely fascinating to uh, to see his uh, journey as an academic in uh, in a school at USC that was very much uh, not in favor of believers being mm-hmm. there, and uh, that uh, even in spite of that, he. Uh, he had a long and successful career as an academic. Um, one quote that it, that was fascinating to me, he was having a conversation with uh, a guy uh, when he was trying to decide, should I become, should I go into pastoral ministry or should I go into the academy and be a professor? And uh, the guy said, um, if you become a pastor, the academy will be closed to you. If you become a professor, the church will always be open to you. Mm-hmm. I thought mm. that was that was fascinating, um, and turned out to be true for uh, Dallas Willard. So anyway, great mm. book. Grab it, read it. Good stuff. What wow. you got, Scotty D? Yeah, I want to. I, wow, mine is mine is not nearly as as sanctifying. Um, oh, wait till you hear mine. Oh, wait till oh. you hear mine. <laughs> Talk about Jesus juke. Wow. This is gonna be this is gonna be better than I listen to T4G for pump up music. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I'm plugging. Uh, it's called Gentleman's Box. It's a subscription service. Um, it you can do a monthly version that that I like funky socks. I like funky ties, and, and this has those. It has uh, other accessories. Um, but they have a, a a step up box that's pretty much the same price, and it actually has useful stuff in it. Um, so, guys, if you're looking to to uh, you know spice up your sock game, um, then then you can do that. Uh, you'll get some some cool ties and other accessories. It's pretty cheap, and uh, if nothing else, they, they make great gifts uh, to give to other people, uh, which I've regifted several things out of it when I'm like. Cool, another Disney wallet. What am I going to do with this? Uh, so, yeah, that's that's my uh, my uh, vain and worldly um, pick of the week. Gentleman's right. box. That's Gentleman's the... box. Okay. Yep. How much? How much is that per month? It's like twenty bucks a month. And you get a tie and a sock. You get a tie, a pair of socks, a couple of cool accessories. I've gotten. Uh, I got a journal. This last one. Um, mm-hmm cufflinks which is awesome except i don't have any shirts that wear require cufflinks hmm. so those are those totally get regifted. um <laughs> hmm. nice awesome. all right dan all right lead us to the you cross ready? are you ready yeah here's mine i love apps as you know i i'm a i love apps i've mentioned quite a few apps on this podcast michael thinks it's been one every week but that's not true but i especially love apps when they help me solve a problem that I have in my life. And so the problem that I have had for years, and this app is actually helping me solve, at least for now, we'll see long-term, but it's been working well for three weeks, is I am always dehydrated. I am completely dehydrated. Mm. I don't drink enough water, and it's a major problem causing uh, just, I mean, lack of water dehydration causes many problems in your life. So I am drinking water, lots of water. I got my water bottle right here. So it's an app called water minder. Uh, I don't know. Let's focus on that anyway. By the way, if you're watching the live video, which, uh, this is the Look first one we have a live video anyway, water minder, it's a app. It's, uh, it does cost, uh, some bucks four ninety nine in the app store to keep and up with your water, bro. Damn health, man. It's that, my health damn, that matters damn, here. Bro. Damn. No, no, no. Listen, four right. nine, not four nine. It's not twenty dollars a month for ties and socks. We're crying out loud. Oh. We're talking five dollars a month. I mean, a period, flat, not per month. Water minder, and this thing is phenomenal because it'll set you a goal based on your 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 activity and your whatever your deal your. Hi, you're, why are you laughing at me, man? You're smirking at me. I, I see mean, you. you know, this is the first time I can see you smirk at me. Listen, okay? I, 
I'm just sitting here thinking <laughs> whoever created that app is laughing all the way to the bank. Dude, I'm t- there are several. Five dollars. No, listen to me. There are several yeah. water apps like this. There are several water apps like this on, on the app store. And this is by gonna, far gonna, the best one. Listen, I'm going to create a new app uh, called the, uh, the Blink app that uh, tells you how many times to blink every minute. I mean, I, man, so, I, so listen, so listen, I'm telling you, <laughs> this is the best five bucks I've ever spent because okay. my health has, it has increased. My energy levels increase. I'm sleeping okay. better at night. A lot of the problems I was having because of dehydration has been solved by this $5 I spent on this app. What so, hey, look, you are the one who buys tobacco scented candles. Now I think that was your <laughs> first pick of the week, bro. How, how much was that candle? That's there right there. Go. Warm tobacco pipe candle. How much That's was that good. candle? Uh, six ninety nine, I think. Okay, this is cheaper than you're literally gonna burn your money away there, man. That you're is true. You're literally burning your. So I'm actually but drink. I'm drinking for my health here in this app, and it's totally worth it. Trust me. And also the the awesome thing, of course, it has an Apple Watch complication. I don't know if you can see there. Okay. Apple Watch complication that I could uh, I could hit here, and import how much water I've drunk in the moment. And then it keeps a track and keeps my goal. And if I don't drink after a while, it'll say, Hey, time for another. And dude, it's awesome. It's awesome. So water minder, the best four 99 you'll ever spend if you're dehydrated. Well, I guess outside of buying some water, but anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, a case of water for four 99 bro. Yeah. Uh, but I, but the thing is, is I will buy the case of water and then forget to drink it. Yeah. That's me, man. If I was having like a bottle a month, that is a lot. Wow. I mean, I was, yeah, I mean, completely dehydrated. So just all the just time. coffee is what you were drinking then. Coffee, soda, Starbucks, you know, yeah. whatever, whatever. Of course, yeah. now I'm, I'm doing the keto thing, so I've changed a lot of that. But anyway, so yeah, still a lot of coffee. But yeah, water minder. That's all my right. pick of the week. Well, I think we lost Scott Douglas. Yeah, I think Scott had a bounce. He said uh, he was meeting his family for an early supper, and I'm like, dude, it is 3:24, so uh, that's wow. like, yeah. I well, mean, we I, do live in Florida, where people run to dinner at 4 p.m. So yeah, and it is snowbird season. So <laughs> it is snowbird uh, season. It's, it's, it's beginning. It may be time to head on. So yeah, yeah. All right. Well, on that note, it's been another episode of the Life and Ministry Podcast, and until next time, this is your best podcast now. Water minder. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Dude, I I knew I knew you were gonna laugh at that pick. I I mean, I'm just saying, Dan. (laughs) Hey, listen, for five dollars, I'll send you a few text messages to remind you that uh, you need to drink water. Yeah, but would you do that for the rest of my life? <laughs> I give you six weeks on this app, and it's it's toast. You think so? Six weeks, man. No, no way, man. No way, dude. No way. <laughs> not, okay, six weeks. <clears throat> Here, let's see. Remind me six weeks today to tell Michael that I'm still using Waterminder. Okay, I'll remind you to tell Michael that I'm still using Waterminder. When would you like to be reminded? Six weeks from today. Okay, I'll remind you. All right. So there you six go. Eleven twenty-two. Is that Thanksgiving? That might be Thanksgiving. All right. Listen. So if you're not uh, using it, if you're not using it, you uh, you owe me a Starbucks. How about that? Deal. Deal. But it's got to be on the honor side system here, right? That is true. Yeah, I and, trust you, Dan. No, well, no, you don't even have to trust me. You don't even have to trust me because in the app. You is can a sh- share it. Look at no, you. No, 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 it's the whole history. Okay. So I can, I can, you, it's hard to see in the screen here, but you can yeah. go the week, the month, the year, and every time I log water. So you will see six weeks from now. So, and if I'm still using it, you're going to buy me Starbucks. Is that, is that the deal? I'll do it. Okay. Deal. All mm-hmm. right. You got it. You got it. Works. All right, boss man. Well, hey, this is, I love, I like this so much better. I do too. To actually, to actually see. To see you guys, I, I think it, it makes the conversation flow more. Yeah, and, I agree. Uh, so I'm going to see how the video turns out, but uh, if it if it looks pretty decent, I'm going to post that on the website tomorrow. Well, actually, right now because this is due yesterday. But I got yeah, okay. I, I, I got to figure that part a little bit because uh, it's going to be some further editing. But anyway, all right, bro. 
Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, thank you, bud. See you. All right. Bye-bye.